Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, November 27th, 2018 uh, meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Um, I will begin by asking our clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Mayor David Narkowitz? Present. Ms. Molly Burnham? Present. Ms. Rebecca Busanski? Ms. Laura Fallon? Present. Ms. Ann Hennessy? Present. Mr. Lonnie Kaufman? Present. Mr. Downey Meyer? Mr. Howard Moore? Here. Ms. Susan Voss? Present. Mr. Ed Zahowski? Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Excellent. Okay, so tonight we have a very focused agenda. This is um, this is not a typical school committee <coughs> where we have public comment and reports and, and other typical votes. We're really focused tonight on the um, uh, data that uh, Dr. Provost is going to present to us about the MCAS uh, scores that our district received earlier in the, in the uh, fall. And um, I know that Dr. Provost, because it's a lot of data and because we're going to try to move through it efficiently, I know he wants to um, propose a way for us to do that in a way that's efficient. And, and so I was going to, I guess, turn it over to you to begin the presentation, but to also to just introduce the, um, the, the technique or the way that you want to go through the data. Sure. So when the committee met in its retreat, one of the things that it was discussed was when we present this data, having a more informal way to discuss it. <coughs> Excuse me, rather than me presenting and then taking questions at the end. So there are a few pieces of this which I'll present as I typically would, but most of the time in the meeting is reserved for um, a protocol for looking at data, which will engage the members directly in making their own observations about the data. Um, using protocols is something that we do in you know, practice as administrators in the district. It's, one of the things that we've also tried to bring down to the faculty meeting level. And so uh, we'll also be using a protocol to do this. The specific protocol we'll be using is called the Atlas Looking at Data Protocol. And so when we get to those two pieces, we'll actually run through the protocol twice. Um, I'll just facilitate the conversation and try to keep us to the timelines that are um, embedded within the protocol. And the members themselves will be um, commenting on the data. And at that point, I would ask you to just sort of help facilitate with your calling uh, and recognizing the members to speak. Okay. I'm going to be moving over there Could so I'm not in the line of Turn the front light. Sure, I'll do that. Thanks. So, uh, we are in a new era of accountability. Um, I found the representation of the bicycles sitting because one of the things that our new commissioner, uh, as I've heard him say in several meetings, is that the original version of MCAS and our original way of trying to apply accountability will look like 19th century medicine in a short while. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what era that bicycle is from, I'm not a bicycle um, expert, but obviously there's quite a difference between bicycles started out where they are now, and I think that the technology of accountability um, has taken a significant leap forward in the new system. Um, so I do want to talk about the first three slides of this together before we get into protocol. Um, first, I want to introduce a philosophy that's embedded within many of the data sets that I'll be asking you to look at tonight, which is based on looking at our performance in relation to comparable schools. Um, that's not the way that people typically look at setting targets. Um, the mes method that the Department of Education uses is basically a um, formula that gets you to where you are, to where they'd like you to be, and a specified sequence of years. But I think that we can have higher aspirations. Um, and so my, my thinking about this is guided by um, someone named Thomas Gilbert. He is someone who brought behavioral technology to organizational development. And his famous book was called Human Competence, um, Engineering Worthy Performance. Because the idea was that what allows human beings to be competent is being embedded within organizations that are set up to bring out the best in them. 
And so one of his concepts is that instead of um, setting incremental targets or just looking at sort of a glide path to get you to a desired outcome, you should look for exemplary performance. And he defined exemplary performance as the historically best instances of performance within relevant constraints. And so looking at your comparable schools is a way of looking at, okay, in this set of observations, what's possible? What's the truly exemplary performance? Um, and the reason it's constrained is because your comparable schools are schools that have very similar demographics. Um, it's not truly the full set of constraints because the demographics are not perfectly matched. And it's not matched in terms of finances, um, which is another reason why I think these are a, a pretty lofty set of goals or a way to think about goals. Because when we compare ourselves to our comparable schools, we're comparing ourselves to schools that are spending sometimes more than $1,000 per pupil more than we are. And still saying, OK, can we get to that, that goal? Can we see that as our exemplary performance? So I just wanted to share that as we get started. And then the, the other thing uh, that I wanted to say about the first three slides is whenever MCAS results come out, the first thing I like to do is take a look at the entire distribution. So I mean, if you could um, go to the next slide. Um, because it, it's very important to know what the range of scores are within the whole state. So these are not our comparable schools. This is every single district in the state. See that there are 357. There are more districts than communities in the state. That's because charter schools are considered to be their own districts. And um, every year, almost regardless of the test, you get a, a, a graph that looks something like this. And so. When I look at data like this, it shows me there's really three groups of schools. Um, they're the ones below the first elbow that are um, really significantly underperforming compared to the rest of the state. Um, if you look at the 2018 data there, that bottom, bottom dot is Holyoke. And they have an average score in ELA of 300, I'm sorry, 479. And then towards the top of that elbow is Lawrence. And there are about 22 schools in between them. Um, some of the schools we recognize as schools being in receivership. And then you have a top, top elbow, too, where you have um, a, a small group of schools that are significantly outperforming the rest of the state. Um, and so that elbow really starts around 515 with Concord Carlisle and goes up to uh, 518 for Mount Prairie Lock. There's about 11 districts that are significantly above the rest of the state. And then what you have are 328 districts that are crammed into the 25 point spread between 490 and 515. Um, and it's important to, to point out that these are scaled scores. So these are scores that, that are intended to stretch out that distribution. And even with the stretching that's going on through the scale transformation, it's still, the schools pretty much clump up in that narrow band. And so one, um, consequence of that is that it doesn't take much of a difference in standard score or raw score to move the needle. So compared from 2017 to 2018 in English language arts, our, our standard scores for grades 3 to 8 increased to 2.3 points. That was enough to move us up 20 positions in rank compared to other districts in the state, and was enough to move us from the 46th percentile to the 52nd percentile, so from the bottom half to the top half. Um, when you look at the comparable districts to see what a truly exemplary performance would be, for us that's Beverly, that's the 54th percentile, so we are really knocking on the door there. Um, when you think of what would be needed to get to the 54th percentile, it's less than one uh, raw score point per student. Um, a raw score point 
more or less you can think of as a question on the MCAS test um, about some of the some of the items have more than one point available to them. So you're talking about every other student getting one more point would bring us to truly exemplary performance in the language arts. So then moving on to math, to the next one. Um, again, you see similar, although the elbows here are a little bit more defined, I think. Um, looking at the uh, Looking at the, the bottom elbow, it goes from about 474, which is uh, Coleman Academy Charter School, to about 490, which is Irving Public Schools. On the top end, it goes from about 300, I'm sorry, 513 to 518, and that's uh, Springfield Prep Charter School and Lexington Public Schools, respectively. And so then you have 300 districts um, in the band between 490 and 515. So again, a similar change from year to year. Um, on this, we gained 1.3 standard score points, um, which is actually less than one question per student. But that was enough to move us up 8% in the state, to move us past 30 districts in the state, and it puts us um, within sort of the interquartile range for our comparable group. So this, we have more room for improvement than we do in the English language arts for sure. But um, you can see that it won't take much to get us up to the top of that group. Part of the reason why there was um, 1.3 was able to get us farther than 2.3 in English language arts was the state as a whole went down when we went up, so that helped us to surpass the districts. And then, um, moving on to science. Um, this one is on a different scale. This is because this is a legacy MCAS. We haven't moved to MCAS 2.0 for science yet, and we haven't moved to it for English language arts and math in the high school yet. And so this distribution, again, has a lot of the same characteristics. It, and this one, you should know, has a double scale transformation um, being applied to it. Because first, raw scores uh, that basically range from zero to 50 are stretched to scale scores that go from 200 to 280, so it's stretched a little bit. And then the 200 to 280 are stretched again, converted into CPI scores that go from zero to 100. So there's a lot of um, attempt in this, this uh, scaling to separate and, and magnify differences between districts. So um, in this one, just talk about the middle range for the sake of time. You have 284 districts that are all between 68.9 and 92.7. Um, and our comparable zone goes basically from 73 to 85. And um, so you'll see that we, we've moved up quite a bit. We're in the top, um, in the upper quartile for our group. And I think not wouldn't take much for us to get to the top of that group either. So I just wanted to um, just wanted to share that with you as sort of a big context. I've said um, before that part of what MCAS um, scoring reports are designed to do is to sort of pull apart districts that are performing not that differently from each other. This is just um, showing you how that happens. So with that said, um, I want to sort of move us into the protocol for our first set of data, which is looking at how our MCAS 2.0 and legacy MCAS look in comparison to our target districts. So I'll take just some time to explain the first one. All of them are set up the same way, um, and then we'll start the protocol. So this is a comparison of Northampton with comparable districts. Again, these are the comparables within our group, the districts that have similar student characteristics. 
Um, later on, we'll be looking at comparable schools because not only does each district get comparable districts, but each school gets comparable schools assigned through the state's DART tool. And um, they're all arranged like this, so they go from low to high. The state average is identified in green. Northampton's um, score is identified in blue. And then for the most part, you see 2017 on the left-hand side and 2018 on the right-hand side. So, um, about to go on the protocol, really about this chart, are there any questions about the way that it is displayed? Okay, uh, so I'll be, uh, as I said, facilitating this. One of the things we do uh, when we do protocols is try to have the facilitator be the only one with the um, copy of the facilitation because one of our rules is when you're listening, don't be practicing what you're going to say for the next part. <laughs> um, and so not knowing what the next part is kind of helps with that. So the first part of this is to describe the data. And when I say describe the data, I'm looking at all of the charts that are presented like this. So it starts in your packets on page two at the top and goes all the way down um, until we get to the part that says cohort analysis. I guess I probably should um, explain one other chart to you before we get into it. So Amy, if you could just go ahead several. I'll let you know when to stop. So you also have this kind of chart, which is, as I said, uh, can you go back? Sorry. Or, that's it. All right, we'll go with this one. Um, so this shows each individual schools. Um, so in each of these um, displays, the school's comparable range is shown right above the school, identified at the bottom of the chart in tabular form. The red line shows the performance of the school named there, and the blue uh, box shows the all the range of scores from the minimum score to the maximum score of the comparable schools. One thing you should know is that for MCAS 2.0, the scores have all been uh, normalized around 500 for math. It's a little bit lower. It's like 498 or 499. Um, but basically, if you think of 500 as the statewide average, you also have the um, state mean running through there. So you can see how schools compare to their group, you can see how they compare to the statewide average, and you can see how they compare to each other by um, putting all the data together into this, in this representation. So is there any question about how these charts work? Yes? Can you just describe who chooses the comparison schools? So clearly there are different comparison schools. Is it based yeah. on family income or... It's How based do you on, in a bin? It's based on student demographics, and it's um, mainly in the different high needs subgroups that are present within the school. Um, so Bridge Street, for example, gets compared to, uh, as you can see, a different range of schools from the rest of them because of the abundance of high needs students um, who are present there. Jackson Street and Leeds uh, both have less. They actually both have the same school identified as their top school. It's a school in Cambridge, um, which, again, we talk about trying to be ambitious. That's a district that's spending a significant percentage of um, funding per pupil more than we are. But Leeds has a different school for its bottom school. So um, they both have the same top. They have different bottom. It's because um, they have slightly different demographics. Jackson Streets is a little bit um, less um, in terms of high needs, so their their range is pushed up a little bit higher. Okay. Yes. And does the um, does Dusty identify new um, schools for comparison schools every single year based on the changing demographics, or is it every so many years? They right. They don't do it every single year. The last time their groups were refreshed was 2016. Okay, so starting the protocol. The first um, part of this is called describe the data. So any of the charts from uh, 
Uh, one starting on page two. So the, the section that says cohort analysis are game for this. And the question just is what you see um, during this part of it. It's, the goal is not to um, try to interpret the data or what it might mean. That does come later on. But it's just to look at what you actually see in front of you. Can you describe the data that you have? And there's about 10 minutes to this. Sure. That's weird. Oh, there we go. Delayed reaction. Okay, so I'll start the timer. Are we to do this individually, John, or? No, this is discussion. This is. Can we go back to the slides? This is included within the slides. Right. I can have I mean, any go to any slide okay. you want. Can we go back a little? Well, I was wondering for like for the people who are here. This I could have you cycle through that group while we're doing this discussion. I'm happy to do that. Okay. Um, well. So just stuff that we noticed? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, I'll say one thing. So Northampton is above the state average in our math, in the MCAS 201 both in 2017 and 2018. <coughs> I'll, I add to that? Yes, please. Um, so I, I'll just add for third to eighth grade. And um, maybe you can help me, John. I'm still digesting the first couple slides. So I think we're above the average, but we weren't in the 50th percentile or higher, I'm guessing, because the median was is different than the average just to put that out there so is that right is that the right way to think about it uh, performance percentiles are not calculated for districts because districts have all different configurations some districts oh are i see schools. okay so, so these percentiles are for what thanks Ms. fallon um Am I right in saying that I think that RFK, uh, Ryan Road, is performing at the top of its comparisons in every area? right we're doing better in English language arts than we are in math so we're above average for third to eighth grade in English language arts and weaker in math below average I think I'd add on to that though that that depends who you compare to because if you look to the comparison to the dark schools, we're <laughs> we're similarly um, similar in terms of math and English language arts in terms of where each school stands in its comparison to the, its group. High school is doing is very high. They're in their comparison group. 
especially in English language arts. Ms. Fallon. Uh, Bridge Street um, and Jackson Street are both performing at the very bottom of their um, comparison schools in both English language arts and mathematics. Ms. Hennessy. Um, in the Legacy MCAS Mathematics Achievement Grade 10 um, are economically disadvantaged and Hispanic Latino students improved from 17 to 18? Am I reading that correct? Um, let me just get on the same chart. Yeah, I think so. Where's the other groups? You are, you are right. It was not just Hispanic and Latino. They are and economically disadvantaged. Yes. Yeah, those two, but the yeah. rest, that's yeah. interesting to me. Yes, Mr. Okay. Uh, looking at science, um, two things. One, it, it does look like we've had some nice improvement um, almost across the board, all and by subgroups from 2017 to 2018. Uh, and then looking at the comparison schools, um, there are some real highlights there. The high school, JFK, Ryan Road, and Jackson Street. Um, with Bridge Street doing better by comparison to the better than English and math. In that, in those, in the comparison chart, yeah. So we've got about four minutes left in this particular segment. Going back to the sec the very last chart, the legacy MCAS grade 10 English and math, comparing it to our high schools comparison schools, it really strikes me that the raw score or whatever the y-axis there is very different for the high school level than the three through eighth grade. And in fact, the shaded region for English language arts it's almost impossible to see if we're right in the middle or if we're a little above. It looks like we're a little above average in that group, but it's hard to tell. And similarly, the math range across our comparison schools is larger, but it's still a quite high score compared to third. Quite kids are doing better by the time they're in tenth grade, or the test is easier, or something. But we are um, relatively lower on that side. So. Sorry. So we're at two minutes. Are, are there any other? Um, okay. So we'll move on. Sure. Analysis, interpreting the data. And here the, the question is: So what does the data suggest to you? Um, what is it? What are the? What does it tell us about students learning? Um, here you ask the why question. Try to figure out as many possible interpretations of the data that you just pointed out as possible. Um, think broadly, want to think creatively. Um, and then one of the things they throw in here, um, which I'll just say, is that uh, assume the data, no matter how confusing, makes sense to someone. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Mr. Cobb. I mean, I think to, Su to Susan's point, um, it's going to be very, um, it's going to be impossible to compare uh, middle school 
and elementary, elementary and middle school to high school until they equate the two tests. Um, and obviously every expectation would be, I guess, that the MCAS 2, when the kids in high school take it, will be, the, the scores will be far reduced, like they, like they were in every other grade level as they shifted. Yeah. So right now we have that uh, challenge of making any sort of comparison, how, how do students go as they proceed. Yes, Ms. Fallon. Uh, I guess I'm questioning why certain cohorts um, were struggling so much harder to meet their needs and to serve them. Their scores are significantly lower for certain cohorts than others. Um, and that is something that I don't understand. To help other people follow along, could you maybe point out? Some so, for example, you when you look at mathematics achievement from CAS 2.0 um, for the grades 5 6 cohort, um, the numbers for economically disadvantaged students with disabilities, Hispanic, Latino, um, high needs, they're, they're all dramatically lower than they are for other cohorts. For example, the fifth to sixth is so low, but then sixth to seventh, there's a significant improvement. And so that's confusing to me why we'd see such a change over one year with one cohort and then, you know, such a decline and then see such an improvement the next year with another cohort. Any theory? Any theories on that? Not that I'm going to suggest publicly. <laughs> okay, Ms. Voss. I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed. I have a qu just an interpretation question. Sure. With the same page that Ms. Fallon was just looking at, are these do? I didn't think kids took MCAS in all these grades. So what are we looking at? So let me answer both questions in order. So there's a really important thing. This is my own theory. I can't um, prove it. You know empirically, but I'll say that it matches my experience in other districts and my experience in this district. A really important thing happens between fifth and sixth grade. Kids move up to a new school. Um, and I think that that is, I think that shows up as a drop in performance for a lot of students. And I think it shows up more pronounced in the subgroups that you point out. Um, one of the things that I think is not unique about middle school, but one of the things that separates middle school from elementary schools that I think makes the transition here difficult, whether you do it in fifth, sixth, or seventh grade, is that you have a new peer group all of a sudden. Um, and one of the things that I just know when I go around the district is the elementary schools have, have such different personalities, characteristics, and then the first time the students come together is in sixth grade. So I think there's some of that that can that might have some explanatory power. Um, the other thing that's different, and it has been part of my discussions with Ms. Wilson, is the, the sixth grade has a different structure than seventh and eighth grade. Um, you know, the fifth grade was set up to be more like, or the sixth grade rather, was set up more like to be like an elementary model to help with the transition. Um, seventh and eighth are set up more like a high school model. Um, where there's a greater depth of content knowledge. So um, it may be that that's actually a better model and maybe the transition of middle may be a combination of the two. Now the question about whether students take every year, uh, in grades three through eight, students take English language arts and math every year. Then they skip until 10 when they take English language arts and math again. For science, students take it in fifth, eighth, and then ninth or 10th. Uh, you can basically pick the year you want to take the science test in high school. Typically, our students take it in ninth grade. You also get to pick the science test that you want to take because in um, fifth and eighth, it's sort of a general science test. In the high school, it's like an end of course test. So you can take biology, take, um, the, they also have a general science test. Most students take biology, it's, it's thought to be the easiest test to pass. And fits into the ninth grade year, so it gets one test out of the way. Okay. So just to make sure, sure. I'm, sorry. Um, if I look at math, I'm just looking at one achievement grade seven to eight cohort. 
um, it's the same group of kids comparing 2017 to 2018. Is that the right way to think about it? Yes, yeah, so I'll just put one caveat on that, which is that our um, system that they use us to analyze this isn't strong enough to exclude all the students who entered mid-year. Sure. So it's somewhat of a different group, but it's mostly the same. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Kaufman. Um, which language arts compares to the arts school? It's, 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 Okay, so thank you. Um, this is similar. I mean, I, I'm looking at this, and I'm I'm really uh, impressed with how Ryan Road is doing. Um, this community my kids went to. It was it was when I went when my kids were there. There was 400, 350 to 400 kids. It was one of the largest elementary schools, and yet it was the only school that didn't um, that wasn't eligible for Title I, meaning, which is uh, based on uh, income. Now um, there's only, I think, 220 maybe students. It's almost half the size, but the proportion of kids is very high in terms of uh, the um, income, special ed, at-risk ELL and other measures. So um, there's some, there seems to be something really nice going on there. <laughs> I just want to draw attention to that. And um, you know, it's a small school, which is great. Um, but there's there seems to be something really good happening there, and I I, um, I think it's worth it's clearly we need to look into that a little bit further as to how the subgroups are doing within that school and see if there's anything in particular driving that um, that we can capitalize on. I'm sure you guys talk about this, but uh, if you have a theory on it, maybe there's time for that. But at the same time, just in terms of analysis, I think that is something that we could really hopefully capitalize on, uncovering what, what if anything, is specific about that school that we can replicate. Ms. Fox? I'm just noticing students who identify as multi-race, I'm looking at the math page, are doing as well as the students who identify as white in math. I haven't looked at the others, it might be the case. Left on the analysis part. Ms. Hennessy. I look at the English language arts achievement three grades three through eight. So that's compiling all the years together. That last slide. Yeah. So I, I get concerned because it feels like for the economically disadvantaged and the Hispanic Latino, what pulls the overall seventeen to eighteen improvement is the three through four and four to five. But the other years are pulling it. Are, does that make sense? So I worry that in the younger years we're doing, we're improving there, mm -hmm. but then we're losing something. That's concerning. Even though it looks good at the end. Right. Right. Oh, the combined three eight. So at the one minute mark, so Miss Voss or Miss. Well, I, it's more a question. Um, so, I know this isn't our fault, but I wish they would give you little error bars to put on these bars, and I assume yeah. they don't. But it, I guess, what's your um, advice on when the bars aren't lined up, how much wiggle room is significant, right? So there's a lot of, Desi really should give us bars on these. So, what I go back to are the first three charts um, that I showed. Yeah. So, um, Think about the scale transformation. Uh, one raw score point in English language arts is two and a half scale score points in the new um, in, in the transformed score. And our comparable schools only have two points difference between them. So from the bottom of the group to the top of the group, it's one question, basically. So, so, when, I, so when I see a difference of just like, a couple of points, yeah. I don't worry. I, I, that may be the standard error measure of the test, but it may just be because, you know, this thing is trying to stretch scores that are really not that different. Yeah, sure. 
No problem. So, I mean, if I look at the JFK scores here, right, it's a lot fewer kids than the statewide stuff. So my sense is if you see changes year to year, um, it's, it's not clear. For example, if most, if, if I don't know what the percentage are, 40 percent identify as white and there's, there's going to be smaller changes because there's more people, but some of these breakdowns have very few kids in them and they're going to have bigger changes, but I think we should be careful about interpreting year-to-year -year changes with small numbers unless they're huge as all that meaningful and I don't know how to do that. Okay. Ms. Burnham, do you have anything? Okay. Okay, so the last part of this is implications for classroom practice <coughs> for the committee is really like implications for what we might be thinking about the next budget, implications for where we want, might want to try to put more support, um, strategies for improvement we might, might want to try to push on harder in the district improvement plan. Um, so 10 minutes for that. Okay. Is there a minute for a question? Sure. Sure. About the target setting. Yes. Um, so the target setting, which we will discuss in more detail when we get into the accountability ratings, okay. is um, I, maybe can we just hold off on that? Yeah. When when I'm looking at these comparisons, this is not the Department of Ed target setting. This is the exemplary practice. Um, target said looking okay so these other districts are constrained more or less like we are how good is the best one able to do and saying can we get to that one which is a much higher target than the state sets okay okay any thoughts on classroom practice implications the question is what implication what implications does this have? Thank you. Uh. Go ahead. Ms. Fallon. Um, so I am wondering if one of the implications is is that we do need to be providing more support at those transition periods. And I don't think that's something that we haven't discussed before, but I mean, that's what I see. Hmm. Ms. Foss? Do you mind putting really any of them, maybe three, two slides into the accountability ratings? Keep going. Going the wrong way, sorry. Okay. Um, help me. I don't know if I understand. We exceeded target. What is? I don't know what all this means. I want to put that in the parking lot with Ms. Okay. Fallon's question because we haven't talked about that yet. Okay. And I'm going to walk through each of those. I'm not going to do the protocol because I think it's different enough from what we've seen in the past. Okay. Is this what we're supposed to be looking at right now? No. We're, no. Locations from the. Am I looking at the wrong one? So we're still looking at the same group oh, of data. Sorry. I'm sorry, I thought we were on yeah. the group. Okay. Again, I think that I'm going to sort of refer to something that Ms. Hennessy brought up, which was the um, the subgroups that need more attention, um, which also is talking about these transition years, um, five, six cohort. But even, you know, in three, four, we can see that that we, you know, we we really have this. Um, we have some students who need some extra attention. Are you speaking specifically to math? Uh, yes. Okay. Exactly. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Um, and you can, you know, you can see it pretty clearly. Ms. Fallon. Um, if we're thinking big picture, I would like to think about the budget implications for when you look at. I mean, granted, the comparison districts are achieving at a higher level at um, Leeds and Jackson Street, but Jackson Street is not achieving 
at a high level within their comparison group and Bridge Street is not and they're also were the two schools that seem to have the biggest struggle with the new inclusion model and so I'm wondering what supports we could provide to those two schools to help with their achievement. Ms. Foss. Um, I'll just build on what Ms. Barnum just said. I think that those same populations, and I'll read them for people listening, students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, high needs, and Hispanic Latino are systematically lower in English language arts as well. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really across the board, and we should be figuring out how to bring, to get rid of that gap. And a question I have would be, there must be overlap in these groups, is that right? So if you're mm -hmm. white and economically disadvantaged or multi-race and also disability, I'm just making these up, but you're filling in two of these bins, is that correct? That's correct. So um, if you fit in the white bin and you have a disability, do you only show up in the chart with the disability or do you show up in both? You show up in both. Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Scott. So one of the one of the nice things the MCAS with the department does with MCAS is uh, allow for item analysis. So it would be interesting to look at um, and you might have mentioned you're gonna do this. I forget maybe we talked about this, but um, so because it's such a narrow band of what questions you need to get right in order to move up, there, there might be some gaps in our curriculum at either of the schools or overall as a district and we should be able to see how we did on certain test items um, that which relate to the standards and see if there's some gaps in our curriculum or ways in which we're teaching it. Um, that would be a significant and probably easier solution than some of the bigger barriers that we're dealing with. But I think it certainly calls for looking at specifically uh, the MCAS scores and which items that we as a district really struggled with and targeting that as an intervention within the classrooms or support, additional support which might come back to us. Yeah. I, I am going to talk about Okay, thank you. Ms. Hennessy. So I worry that as we get so granular with MCAS data, and focused on how we improve our scores, that it actually has a, a negative effect on our meeting our social emotional needs in our schools, mm -hmm. and that it actually does has an adverse effect. So as we meaning as we become overly focused on bubble kids, I don't I'm not saying you're doing that, John, right. and and these points, these scores, then our schools become very stress, more stressful than they already are, and then this is not what students need. So I like what we're doing, and yet, and I want to see this, and yet that's also my concern, so. Ms. Foss. And now I'm looking for MCAS 2.0 mathematics comparison to DART schools, and it's the one with the four elementaries and the JFK. If anybody think it's earlier. Next one. There it is. There it is. So, so if you ignore the gray areas because they've assigned different comparisons to our different schools, and you just say our Northampton schools maybe aren't as different as these gray areas. Mm -hmm. um, so, it was just interesting mm -hmm. to look across at the red lines and say, um, I don't think there's that big a difference between Jackson, Leeds, Ryan Road, and JFK. I mean, there's certainly small differences, and Bridge Street really stands out as needing some more support. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see that line get up, and then they really don't look that different to me. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I wanted to say about this was related to um, the comment that Ms. Hennessy just made. Uh, as I was discussing my own goal setting with the, the subgroups that evaluates me, I've said that you know there are really three stages of improvement that you can think of as a district, or at least only three I've been able to think of. One is, can you get above statewide average, um, which is something we've been talking about doing for a long time, which I think in itself is a lofty goal, because then you can say you're in the top half of schools and the top state in the nation a pretty good value proposition for taxpayers and for parents. Um, but then there is another level. It's this, this um, real truly exemplary performance level. You can think of, okay, well, if you're in a group that happens to be above the statewide average, can you get to the top of your group? But then once you do that, then I think you should be liberated to think about other things. Because there's no, I mean, for example, Vine Road 
I don't think it's reasonable for us to expect that it's going to do much better. It's the exemplary school in its group. Um, so I think that should be a school that really can focus on the other things that may be more life-giving. Um, and I'd like to get them all to that level. Um, but I do think that's the next thing. I think it's not like just this race do we keep going until every single kid is, you know, 515. I think you get as far as you can get within your constraints, and then you think about the other things that are important for a school that can't be measured on a test. Ms. Hmm. Burnham? Yeah, I mean, and sort of touching upon that, when I was talking about these kiddos who might need more attention, I <clears throat> actually really mean that a lot of times I think that they need attention in the social, emotional, and and very much, you know, ex I mean, I mean, we have amazing teachers and they know what the kiddos need and we know that doing well on a test is based on many, many, many factors, um, as well as even getting to school. And, uh, and that comes up in the accountability grades. Right. So we're at 30 seconds on our, on our this current 10 minute round. Any other final thoughts? Oh, Ms. Fox. Yes, I'll, I'll just present an alternative. I, I agree with you on the social emotional aspects, but I don't want to lose track of the fact that um, if you go look at an MCAS test, if you go look at release questions for these different grades, and I've looked, I, I didn't know they were there for every grade, but I looked at the third grade and the eighth grade ones, and you find most of them are pretty reasonable. They're not really asking kids to do something out in left field from what I can tell. And so I just want to put in, I think, I agree, I, I want to see these all go up and maybe above 50 percentile, maybe that's a different conversation, but in combination with these other needs so that we can graduate students who are ready to go have meaningful whatever it is, whatever they're doing, be members of society that can think. Uh, just to be clear, I don't have any disagreement that we can get about 50 yeah. percentile. If we go back, maybe, I don't care, English language arts or math, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so that's those blue ones that we keep going to. <laughs> In the wrong place. The comparable district? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'm right there. That's mm -hmm. good. That, that's science. We haven't talked a lot about science. Um, actually, no. I don't know what the average is on that. So we go to the secretary to that. Okay. Um, so I, I said that they're um, normalized around 500. So we are above average in two already. We're kissing average in two. Um, just Bridge Street is, is the one that we need to get up. And all of them go above the uh, middle score of 500. So what I was saying is that's because of our comparable schools. Um, and I, I just think that's important to, to remember because there are some districts where their entire yeah. bar of schools may be between 480 and 490. Maybe 490 is a great score for them. Right. Maybe it's the best in their group, mm -hmm. but still below the statewide average. Not that's not the case for Northampton. I think we can aspire to more, um, but we have our own limits. Um, you know, especially if you think of Jackson and Leeds, their comparable group includes two schools from Cambridge, which, relatively speaking, has much more resources to put into education. So if we can reach that, then you can say, okay, we've done a really, really good job. Um, okay, so, Thanks. sorry. Well, I was just gonna ask at any point, um, with the new um, textbooks at the elementary schools, is there has there been any um, indication that maybe they are not the sequencing is not in line with the um, MCAS. That's a great uh, segue into what I was going to talk about with these. Um, I made a facilitation choice early on, which is not to be two rounds, but to do one round because you started to get into the cohort analysis while we did this. Um, so um, I'll just talk about both of those and share some um, thoughts about those questions that came up. Um, and I thank you for your insights. You know, part of the reason that I'm trying it this way and holding back is really to see if you see other things in data when we do these data explorations is to try to get as many perspectives as possible to generate possible solutions. Um, so looking at, uh, I'm gonna ask you to move 
back to the um, beginning where the gray and green and blue charts start. So, uh, English language cards, 17, 18. Go to 18, please. Um, when I look at this, I don't really see the need for any kind of special intervention in English language arts. We do have some subgroups that are um, not performing as well, and I think we need to try to continue to support them more, but it's very incremental. Um, the challenge in English language arts is not to break it, right? Um, so the difference here, as I've said, is less than one raw score point per student. So, and where we can get the improvement is from some of the subgroups you've identified that aren't performing as well. So it's mainly um, working on uh, students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged students. If we can improve the performance of that group, we can get that less than a point we need in order to be at the top of our group. Um, moving on to, uh, you can go on some more. Moving on to math, um, this is an area where I think it's a multi-year project. Um, we did make a lot of gains last year. We moved from being the bottom of our group to being in the middle of the group and coming close to the statewide average. But there the difference is more like, um, more like three or four raw score points. Um, and it'll be different things in different places. One of the things you pointed out in your own analysis of the data was that there was this dip between third grade and fourth grade. Um, that's something that jumped out to us as administrators as we first started to look at it. And what we've been able to determine with the help of our math coach is that the fourth grade MCAS very heavily sampled fractions and we didn't do well on that at all. Um, so one of the things that we're doing um, as an adjustment to the fourth grade curriculum is trying to do a better job with teaching fractions, trying to make sure that that um, unit comes in a little bit earlier, making sure that we teach to a higher level of mastery. The other thing we found was that we may not have been as strategic, and this may be bubble kit area, so sorry. We may not have been as strategic as we could have been in actually administering the test because unlike the paper-based podcast, where the computer-based, you have a wide window. You don't have to give it all on the same day. You have several weeks over which you can give the test. And we gave it towards the beginning. So this year, I think we'll give it towards the end, which will give us time to give students greater exposure. Um, so that's, um, that's an area. The other thing that we saw in math in general, um, and this I do think speaks to uh, why I think it was good to go to Math Investigations 3. One of the areas where we also lost points were any of the constructed response questions where students had to explain how they got their answers. Um, so for a lot of um, the math questions, they're not necessarily one point questions. You might get one point for the answer itself, but then one or two more points for the explanation you give as to how you derive the answer and that's where our students um, showed some weaknesses. That is a key um, part of the Investigations 3 curriculum. It was part of the Investigations 2 curriculum, but it's obviously something that we can do a better job with. And it's an important skill. That's one of those things I don't feel badly about trying to help students with that because that's a life skill. You know, when we're in a school committee situation looking at data and explaining different interpretations, helping someone else understand the data behind your thought is an important process. Um, so looking at the high school tests, um, one of the things that you pointed out was how high the scores are in general. Um, and so in English language arts, it really is just a matter of a small group of students who are failing. Um, it, the way that scale transformation works is students get 0, 25, 50, 75, or 100 points based on what their MCAT score is. If you're failing, you get 0. We, and so to improve the English language arts and math, it's really a matter of moving four kids out of failing. 
And when you look at who they are, uh, we only had five kids who were failing. Um, they were all students with disabilities. That's obviously where the, the more support needs to go. Um, looking at math, again, I said, I think having a goal of getting 1.3 to 2 more points in terms of standard score per year, I think is reasonable. I think it will take us probably two or three years to get to the top of our group at that rate. Um, but it's a matter of finding those things where the gaps are. Um, in some cases, it's a, a identifiable problem with our curriculum, like fractions in the fourth grade. In other places, it may be the type of support we're providing the students transition from one school to the next, um, like we were talking about in sixth grade. Um, another thing we'll be talking about when we get to accountability is it may also be interventions that aren't related to the delivery of instruction itself. It may be around things like attendance, um, where we've also shown some issues. Um, no matter how much we improve curriculum and instruction, if students aren't there to receive it, it's unlikely that they'll benefit much. Um, so those are, those are some of the things that have come out of our uh, discussion of this. Um, in science, we know it's a matter, because this is another one that is, you're on the right track. This is another one that is based on the legacy MCAS. It's about kids in the failing range. So the difference between Northampton and Monomoy is about 18 students who are in warning. Um, and we know where they are. Um, we've got about 22 in fifth grade. We've got about 32 at the eighth grade. There's almost none at the high school. So it means the area where we really can improve our science achievement is uh, looking at curriculum in elementary and middle. And we are revising the curriculum in science for the next gen standards in elementary and middle. So I think that will, that will um, definitely show improvements over the next several years. The other thing that I think is really um, important about the fifth grade test is a, a lot of the work we're doing in English language arts I think will show up there because um, when you look at the actual skill that students are required to show on the mat, on science test in fifth grade, a lot of it has to do with their ability to read and comprehend. So those are some of the strategies that come out of our looking at this. Um, and now what I think I'll do next is go to that um, accountability ratings piece that everyone's asking questions about. We have to a whole new test a whole new animal in this game. Do you have so, questions? I, I do. I don't know if it's... Can I ask a question? Sure. sure. Um, so if you had 30 kids fail, as you, I don't know what square that means, but fail, say, the math MCAS in sixth grade, and you know who they are, what is the intervention at that point in Northampton if, if you're in one of those 30? What happens? How do you get help so that the next year you don't and that you're ready to take math in seventh grade? Well... Unfortunately, one of the things that we found is that many of those students are already receiving help. It's not just, you know, evenly distributed among all of our groups. That group of students who's failing is heavily um, from students with disabilities subgroup and English language art or English language learners subgroup. So they're receiving interventions through special education and through the language department. Um, that probably is the best kind of support we're able to provide for them. There are some students who aren't in any kind of a category who also fail. Um, for them, really, it, it's a matter of trying to figure out what the gaps are in their um, prerequisite skills and fill them in. Um, it's one of the things that teachers talk about all the way up, that um, students don't come to them as um, with as full of a set of skills as they would hope. Um, and so part of the diagnostic process is figuring out where the gaps are. Um, when it's gaps that 
impact a large part of your class it's a little bit easier to address because you can go and reteach and it'll have some relevance to um, multiple students when you have gaps that are only one or two kids it gets a little trickier um, because finding time to work with them individually is tough and that really is um, pretty much the only way to address those types of gaps follow up and then so so i guess take the ones out who are already being helped extra for whatever reason disability or other things but somebody who does poorly on the MCAS, is there a process in place? Like, would they get some sort of intervention if they weren't already getting extra help because they failed the MCAS? Or do we just hope a teacher notices? Like, what's the process for that? So we don't have intervention strategies that are based purely off the MCAS test. Um, in fact, one of the things we try to do is make sure we have multiple measures for any kind of assessment system that we do. But if you have students who are showing weaknesses in multiple areas and different types of assessments, in the elementary grades, we have Title I, um, which provides support both in English language arts and math. One of the things we've heard, and this may be something to discuss later on, is that we're really putting the majority of those resources in grades K through three. And um, principals have said maybe having more of that in grades four and five would be helpful. Um, in sixth grade, we do have a reading class um, for students who are struggling just with basic literacy skills. Um, we don't really have a math specific intervention class that would be sort of comparable to that. But you know, our, our data is that almost all those kids who are in that group are either students with disabilities or ELLs. Not 100%, but the large majority. Ms. Fallon. Um, I think I have a two-part question. So when you're talking about particularly the ELL subgroup um, and the economically disadvantaged subgroups, those are two groups that do tend to have, um, we have a lot of mobility in and out of the district. How long, like, are we judged um, the first year? Are they, help, are they within our accountability districts the first year that they move into the district? Or is there like a lapse? And the same thing with ELL, that first year of instruction, are they even required to take the MCAS or is it after the first year? For ELLs, they're excused for one year on English language arts, but not on math or science. Okay. And then for students who are new to the district? You can arrive the day we're testing and you have to take the test and you're assigned to the district. Okay. Hmm. So does is does that have a significant impact? I mean, I don't have I, I don't see that data. Well, it's I mean, I'm just saying, like, is it is it always showing, like, in those subgroups, it could be that it's not even showing the education they're getting here. Probably the best way I can answer that is to go back to a question I had discussed about how the power of our um, tools to exclude students who come mid-year are um, is limited. So here's what we can do. Um, you can take the 10th grade cohort and say, exclude all the students who weren't here from third grade. You know, students who came anywhere along the line, or you count them all. If you if you choose the exclude kids who weren't here for their entire education, it's less than half of the students we have. Um, so mobility is something that impacts us tremendously. Um, when you think of the overall churn rate from grade three to grade ten, is more than half of your student population. Students have received a variety of different types of instruction. I'm not saying anything was you know, faulty with the instruction they received, but it's hard for kids to go from one system to another system. It's hard for them to go just socially from having one set of peers to another set of peers. That has an impact. I can't tell you how much that is in terms of how, that, how much that affects our, our performance, but it has an impact. Okay. Okay, so then accountability ratings. Um, so this is a brand new, uh, brand new type of report that all of our students will receive, and it really combines two concepts. One concept is improvement, or what I am talking about publicly and privately as equity and achievement. Now the improvement score, which I think is related to equity, talks about how successful you are in moving up students who have historically been underperforming. 
there's two groups um, that, that count into that. One is your subgroup students, and then the other is this group called the lowest 25%. Um, one of the things I think is a very important change in accountability for everybody to understand is the accountability rating has been tweaked to make helping students who are struggling more important than it was in the past. So now um, the bottom 25% of students in a school count for half of their accountability and the other 75% count for the other half. So it sort of has a, a super abundant value to the lowest performing 25 students, 25% uh, of students. Now, it's interesting in Bridge Street, they actually don't have the lowest performing 25% groups, the only school that doesn't. It's because the lowest 25% is pulled from a whole district. Um, and you need to have at least 20 of them in order to form a cohort. If you have fewer than that, they just show up to zero. So that's why you don't have that at Bridge Street. But you still have the other factors, reducing chronic absenteeism. Um, you don't have anything about high school completion, obviously. And um, the other change here is that growth is counted more than it was in the past. Part of the reason for that was superintendents and other groups advocated on behalf of um, schools I was talking about earlier that maybe you're doing a really good job but will never make even you know the 50th percentile they can show growth and so we wanted to have growth count more into the formula um, so the uh, factors on this chart all go into what's known as an improvement score and that's a score that can range from zero to a hundred um, and Basically, anything from 25 to 50 is considered to be pretty decent improvement. If you can be above 75, that's really good improvement. Um, this, um, I think, adds a new dimension. There's so much discussion about Bridge Street and its difficulties, but look at that improvement score. You know, this is a school that really is effectively moving up the most struggling students. It's still 23rd percentile. It still needs to make improvements in terms of achievement, but it's showing that it's effective at bringing up those bottom performing students. And so then where that comes from, I, I, this front page I think is almost like um, not the best one to look at. I think what's better to look at is where these things come from. So for each school, moving on, um, you have, Achievement in English language arts, math, science, and then growth, and then the other non-academic factors. These, uh, thank you. These um, scores are obtained based on how this how the school did in relation to its preset target by the state. Now, the question of how was that target set? It was basically a number that was backed into based upon the, um, the changes that were seen between 17 and 18. And so they found that um, on average, basically in most grades, most tests, there was about a 1.5 standard scale score improvement from 17 to 18. So they said that will be basically the target we're looking for. Um, some groups, that, some schools that are lower, you may want to push them more and say, okay, they need to get two points. Um, but you can see that in Bridge Street's case, it was much above that for all of its subgroups in English language arts. It exceeded the target across the board. So they get four points for every group that that's where they exceeded. They get three points for any group where they meet. Um, you get two points for improving but not hitting the target, and then you get uh, one or zero points for declining, depending on how much you decline. Yes. Am I misunderstanding? So are the targets set before or after the test scores? They're set before the test. Okay, so will we know the 2019 target? I don't know. Um, this year, let me say this. They're set before the test scores are reported. 
This year we started receiving results in late June and we got sort of the first draft calculation of what our targets would be in July. Um, I think that it's reasonable to expect that they're going to be somewhere in this range next year. Maybe we'll know earlier, maybe we won't. Um, in part, they had to wait this year until they had the scores because they were basing it on the average change from 17 to 18, so they didn't know that until they had the scores. Um, we'll see how that goes rolling forward. But I mean, I just got to say this, part of, part of um, understanding what happened last year has to be celebrating what went well. And there were so many discussions about Bridge Street School that were so difficult. I think it's really important to celebrate what happened here in English language arts. I mean, to me that's not a picture of chaos. I'm not saying that it didn't happen. I'm saying there were some good things that, that happened at Bridge Street School last year. Um, moving on. This is math. This is where they didn't do so well. We showed plenty of um, charts showing they're the bottom of their group, they're the bottom of the district. Um, I don't know why they didn't have the same kind of improvement in math that they were able to show in English language arts and in science. Um, so you can see there they didn't score points. Um, they got one point for all students. They got three points for economically disadvantaged um, for meeting the target. Everyone else did not meet the target. Um, so clearly, all of the data says if you want to point one thing to work on in the district, it would be math at Bridge Street School. But I don't want that to overshadow the accomplishments of some of the good things that happened. Um, yeah. Ms. Foss? Can I just, uh, so just to be make sure I'm clear, this is third, fourth, and fifth grade. Third, fourth, and fifth, yes. And there was 100 students in the previous cohort, or two, maybe two didn't have to take English language for the reasons or that absent. you described earlier, right. or were absent. Right. Um, and, and so that, yes, okay. But yeah. this isn't reflecting first or second grade at Bridge Street. No, at all. for kindergarten. Right, okay. And then uh, moving on, Any? Oh, sorry. Um, so that's science. Um, in science, you notice there aren't any subgroups. The reason is because it's only fifth grade. As I said, you need to have 20 students to make a subgroup. There are only basic 33 students who took the test in all of fifth grade. Um, there was a problem there with um, uh, non-participation in testing. That's something that you know I know this, this school council has talked about, and something that um, Principal Choquette is talking about with parents. Um, it's very important when you have a small group and a small test that everybody participates because you have to reach 95%. Um, we had four parents, I think, whose students did not participate in science, and so they um, were flagged for low participation because four out of 34 is, or would have been 37, is more than 5%. Um, but look at what they did. The, the goal here was for them to get a three-point improvement, basically. They got an almost 18-point improvement. Um, so again, I think it's important that we tell this, this story of Bridge Street as we tell the story of math isn't where we want it to be yet, but it's got to get there. I mean, you can't see scores going up in English language arts and science and not believe that they're going to go up in math, too. Um, especially when they're using the same interventions, the same curriculum, the same process that all the rest of the schools are using that are already showing better achievement. Um, so then there are some non-academic um, non factors that are included. Well, I'm sorry, should you growth first? Um, this one I'll tell you I'm ambivalent about um, just as a measure um, because In the other reports the department has, the middle range of growth is basically 40 to 60, which is their way of saying there's an error band of 20 points centered on 50. Um, and so in order to achieve your target in growth, the target is always 50. Um, and so you know, it just seems like with the error band being so wide, it would 
be better if there was a, a range of target instead of a number. But you see, um, we're below target in growth in ELA, except in the area uh, of white students. Again, part of the issue of the error band, if there's a 20 point error band and there's a six point difference between all students and white students, is that really a significant change? Or even, you know, a uh, what is it, 12 point difference between high needs and white students? Is that significant? I don't know. It's hard for me to say that it is. Um, but that is what we asked for. We asked for more growth <laughs> in the model, so we have it. And so um, we want to try to get the growth measure up to 50. Um, and then you also get a growth measure in math. You um, can see similar, somewhat lower. One thing that I don't like is students' disabilities, their growth measure here at Bridge Street, because that's below even the error band. And it confirms one of the things that um, is a very troubling finding in special education, which is that when students are identified and start receiving special education, they start growing slower in many, many cases. Um, so um, the goal should be for them to get on a more steep learning curve so that they can close the gaps, but often the opposite happens. So um, more work to look at special education support for students there. The other thing that um, is included in this is absenteeism. Um, and so this is another area where Bridge Street did a really good job last year. You know, in spite of the troubles, parents sent their kids. And so I really wanted to say thank you to the Bridge Street parents for this and the parents across the district because when I think of the homeschool partnership and one thing that you can do that can be really impactful on your student success, it's sending them to school. Um, it's something we struggle and we find a really direct link to our groups where absenteeism is an issue and overall academic achievement. I know sometimes it's hard because they don't want to come to school because they're not achieving, but if that can become a very vicious cycle and so, just thanks to the parents for sending their kids to Bridge Street. Yes. Can you just define what they're, what these numbers like? What's what's considered chronic absenteeism? Chronic absenteeism is being absent more than ten percent of the days of membership. So if you were present for all the whole school year and you were absent eighteen or more days, you were chronically absent. If you're only there for half a year and you're absent more than nine days, you are chronically absent. So this is a high level of absenteeism, you know. Um, 2017, for example, students with disabilities, 18% of them were absent 18 days or more if, if it's the whole school year. Last year they got that down to 13, it was ahead of their target, um, so they were met or exceeded all across the board. So um, all of these numbers roll up to that um, to that first page, and that's how they get the, the accountability rating for the school. So every school has one. For all of the elementaries, they're the same, except you know the, the numbers change in each of them. Um, you have those figures, and you can go through them at your leisure. Uh, you know how the system works. I do want to um, point out the high school because they have somewhat of a different measure. And at both point, maybe just say something here. Um, this was. This has to be recognized too. When I'm setting my really ambitious goal, saying can Jackson Street be as good as that school in Cambridge, um, they look bad. When you look at them like this, which is what was their um, achievement compared to other elementary and middle schools across the state, it's high. And when you look at how they did equity in terms of bringing up their bottom students, it's really high. Um, it's hard for me to know why this wasn't recognized as a school of distinction because I see other schools, you know, there's no formula for it, you know, that, that's a determination that gets made at the discretion of the um, commissioner. But this Jackson Street did every bit as well as some of the schools of distinction. Um, so I won't belabor the point, but they could have the same kind of process to get those. You can just go through the next. See, they're meeting and seeing pretty regularly all the way through. Um, Leeds, um, again, they had um, they had a little bit more difficulty. They started with a higher level of achievement and had some more difficulty bringing up 
their bottom group, um, but still did a uh, solid performance. Ryan Road, you just go back again. Ryan Road is another one that I think I look at 77% improvement score, 62nd achievement percentile. That's as good as some of the schools of distinction. And we know that it's at the top of its group. So I don't know why, you know, I mean, let me just say this. Whoever else recognizes it, I recognize that it was a tremendous year at Ryan Road School. You can see they were strongly exceeding their targets all over the place. Um, so we'll stop quickly at middle school. I want to point out something here. Um, the 42nd percent achievement level, I think we can, uh, as I said earlier, I think we can get that up to the top half. We should definitely work for its reasonable goal. But I want to say that I'm happy about where this is for this year because middle schools got hammered in this new accountability rating across the district, across the state, because their comparison group changed. Um, in prior years, their achievement percentile was as a, a percentile of all the middle schools in the state. This year, it is uh, their, their achievement as a, um, a, a, where they fall in the range of all elementary and middle schools. So any school that, that teaches a grade or tests a grade three through eight is in the same group. So the middle schools are now in the elementary schools, and historically the elementary schools have had higher performance. Um, there are a lot of uh, middle schools that land from like the 50th percentile down to the 20s. Um, we did see a little bit of a dip at JFK, but not as much um, because some of the underlying pieces were strong. Two things that were strong in particular were English language arts and math. Now, the, we did decline. We did decline, so we didn't pick up as really many points for the, um, the improvement towards targets, but we're already starting at a high level. Um, you can see that if you think that 500 is the average, above average for all students, some subgroups below, that's where the work needs to go. We can't continue to get to the highest um, level unless we can bring those subgroups up. But they were starting from a strong point. Again, math, it was pretty close to 500 but with differences in the subgroups. Um, science, I think, was a real success story. This is high for their comparison group. So um, the one thing I didn't talk about is why science doesn't get a growth rating. It's because there's only one um, test in each school, so you can't compare anything to show growth. And then the high school, um, is a different accountability system. Again, I should point out maybe absenteeism. Yeah. Go back for a second. This is where we're focusing a lot of our efforts in the middle school. Um, you look at those underperforming subgroups that we pointed out in the other areas. Um, look at how high the chronic absenteeism is. Even for all students, it went down. But economically disadvantaged was close to 30% of the kids being absent 18 or more days if they're full year students. Um, that's, that's a huge impediment to progress. Hispanic Latino students, 31%. Um, I can tell you that we monitor this now because um, we're really focused on whether we're setting up for that again or whether we're able to have some um, better luck with students attending school. And the results so far look promising. Um, we just had the 60th day of school, so we're about a third of the way through the year. And I can tell you, for example, uh, right now, chronic absenteeism would be absent six or more days. The Hispanic and Latino subgroup has about 15% of their students who are absent six or more days. So it's reasonable that we could bring those numbers down as long as we don't have you know, a blossoming of absenteeism later on in the year. I think PBIS may have a lot to do with that. You know, Having your teachers out there to greet you when you enter the school, I think sends a different message than meeting them in homeroom. Um, I do think that a lot of work has been done around making the school climate more inviting at the middle school, and I hope that will show up with this. I'm not sure that's going to be enough. Um, I did. Um, 
and we'll be talking about a grant when we get to budget time for having uh, a new position that's focused on um, attendance because I think that, as I said, whatever else we do, it's not going to matter unless we can get students in the classroom. And when you look at attendance rates like this, um, it calls for an intervention. Ms. Fallon. Um, are these excused or unexcused? It doesn't matter? Doesn't matter. And have you found, I mean, through any of your work, is any of this actually related to a lack of access to health care? Uh, I can't say that I've looked at that specific question. I, but it's just when you see like economically disadvantaged students, you do worry that it's potentially related to the lack of health insurance and so conditions may go untreated or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and so, you know, we do have interventions in place for that. Our nurses do make referrals to Mass Health. Um, we do have data on how many students who are able to enroll in health care who are not receiving health care. Um, I don't think there's a large number of a large uninsured population of students that we're aware of. There could be ones that we're not aware of because they haven't presented to the nurse for help. Um, but. I don't think that's really going to be the intervention that drives this. I think it's going to be more around school climate um, and, and that partnership of saying, parents, it's really important. What can we do to get kids to come to school? Ms. Burns? Just to follow up, do you find when you look at the data of the absenteeism, um, do you find clumps like in the winter that there's more? I mean, are you, do you look at it or is it just if you were to put it into a chart? I. Um, I haven't seen that. Uh, it's been, we've been monitoring this for quite some time. Not even last year when this was happening, we were looking at it. Yeah. Um, there, for example, in other places where I worked, there was a very predictable midwinter um, absenteeism among some groups that went to visit their home nation. Uh, that's not the case in Northampton. What I see more is um, a steady accumulation. Some of this we contribute to ourselves because um, suspension counts as an unexcused absence. Um, and some of the groups that are highest on this list for absenteeism are also highest on the list for being suspended. Um, so that, I think, contributes. So um, I think the interventions that are going to be effective here are the ones that are around trying to make school as inviting as possible and then um, trying to improve communication at home. Um, we are in the process of setting up a meeting with the ELL PAC um, for, on this very issue. Just to talk to parents about what are the barriers, what can we do, how can we work together to have school, have students attend more regularly, because I think that will be a big difference. Ms. Hennessy and Mr. Kaufman. There's a quick um, intervention that was done. They released a study in the spring and just telling parents about 30 days into a school year where their child fell within the um, and their absences, like your child was absent five days, most students were absent only one day. Because I, I don't think parents know yeah. what is average. I mean, I'm in school and I sometimes am like, my kid's too sick, like, and just that simple intervention had a positive impact over the end of the school year. I know that was interesting. Thank you. Yes, thank you for sharing that. It's like the electric bill. <laughs> no, it's true. Like that was actually found to be one of the most effective ways to get people to reduce their energy consumption was sort of comparing them to their neighbors. Yeah, Mr. Kaufman. Yeah, I, mean, I think in line with the school cultures, your work on and our work on the code of conduct and redoing the code of conduct hopefully will help here. I'm just wondering too whether you have had a chance yet to see how these numbers compare to the state or comparison schools or schools within our region. Are these? I have not. Um, that would be a good thing to take a look at. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, okay. So then just to quickly take a look at the high school, because they have a different formula too. Um, so here's something I just want to call out. Um, because the high school has a great reputation and it's deserved and it should continue to have that. But I want to point to the improvement score. Because if you think of that as a measure of equity, think of that as a measure of how effective it's being at um, bringing up the kids who are struggling, it's the school that's the least effective in the district. Um, so an improvement score of 23 means that it missed a lot of its um, marks with the lowest 25% of students. Um, 
even though it had a high achievement percentile overall because the rest of the students were performing so well. Um, so I think that's just something to think about as a committee and, and certainly something we're thinking about as an administrative team um, to put a greater equity focus on the high school. Um, so then they have the same measures with English language arts and math. Um, remember they're taking the legacy MCAS so their scores look different. Um, they did, I do want to point out that they've shown some really nice growth in the Hispanic and Latino subgroup. Um, that's been part of the equity focus. You heard me talk about at the end of last year. They also have um, shown some nice growth with economically disadvantaged students. Um, but there's more that needs to be done, especially in that lowest performing group. That lowest performing group means you're lowest performing for whatever reason. You can belong to a subgroup, maybe you don't belong to a subgroup, you're just not performing as well as the rest of the students, and that's half of the calculation now. So, more work there. Um, and then, after you get it through growth, the high school also has these other measures. They get points for their four-year graduation rate, which is really good um, to see that we're exceeding targets or improving below targets everywhere. Um, that's going to be something that maxes out soon. You know, we do have work to do with students with disabilities. Um, we do have some work to do with Hispanic, Latino, but it's going in, going to pretty much hit 100% soon. Um, next is the extended engagement rate. This one declined, but I feel this is countercyclical with the graduation rate because engagement means so what are you doing to bring back students who didn't graduate? So I think the more students you're graduating on time, the less you're going to be able to engage. Go ahead. Go back one slide. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, there's a phenomenal change from 2016 to 2017. Do we know why? I, Across the board. I don't know why. I know that the high school administration puts a great deal of effort into catching kids who are off track for graduation and trying to get them back on. And they are extremely creative in um, the solutions they put together for students from credit recovery. I do know that we made it an investment in a new credit recovery system last year, mm -hmm. and that may, that may be showing up here. Um, but they will work extensively with kids to try to get them to graduation on time. Um, and then the high school dropout rate, again, very low. Um, for all students, the dropout rate is less than 1%. Um, it's hard to get too much better than that. Um, and then so their chronic absenteeism. So this is something we're looking at at the high school, too. You can see the same groups showing up almost at the same levels. Um, and I think it's even a little bit more of an issue at the high school because you have the senioritis thing. Um, there's more of a culture of maybe skipping at the high school. Um, so if graduation notwithstanding, the good performance notwithstanding, I think this is an area where the high school can really focus, especially for putting an equity lens on it, look at the groups we'd be focusing on for chronic absenteeism, and be trying to make sure that all students um, really avail themselves of the educational opportunities the high school provides. Um, they also have a measure for advanced coursework completion. I have measured this one among our, sub, our, our uh, comparison groups, and we are basically number eight out of ten. And I contacted the other two, um, uh, eight, going from the bottom, so ten will be the top. I contacted the two districts that were ahead of us and said, how are you getting this? Because they were showing 100% of their students enrolled in advanced coursework. Um, both, of the, both of the schools said that there might be a data problem. And I actually called the Department of Ed and said, it looks like there's a data problem because they were reporting 100% of all students were taking advanced coursework, even though they were showing, you know, like some of their subgroups were only taking, only 80% of the kids are taking advanced coursework. So how can you have 100 in the aggregate if you have less than 100% in the subgroups? Um, but that being said, we can still look at ourselves. 
and we've shown some declines from the past year, some pretty dramatic declines. Um, so one of the things that has been a part of our equity focus is trying to get more students from these um, more struggling subgroups access to advanced coursework completion. Um, one of the schools, one of those two schools, did say they, they did have an intervention that um, might have helped, um, which is they had, this is definitely not what I'm recommending, um, but they had budget cuts, and so they cut out all their general level courses in some subject areas, so kids were forced to take honors or AP, um, so that did help their participation rates. Um, but it does, it does raise a question, I was talking to the superintendent of, well, if it wasn't a budgetary problem, maybe it would have been a good thing to do anyways, because your kids aren't failing, right? They're accessing higher level classes. Um, I don't think we should do anything that extreme, but we are talking about how can we be more effective in recruiting? How can we spot kids who are um, ready for a challenge and really get them to, to consider courses that they maybe wouldn't sign up for otherwise to try to make sure that um, kids are really, um, the kids we have enrolled in our higher level classes are representative of the kids that we have throughout the high school. Also, Pathways is a, is a part of this. Um, the IT Pathways is a very diverse pathway. I'd like to do more Pathways because every one of those Pathways starts with a skill that a kid is just really interested in and ends with higher level math or science courses. So I actually have three questions I've been watching. So I have Ms. Oh, yeah, Burnham, just... and then I have Ms. Voss, then Ms. Uh, Fallon. Thanks. I was just curious, um, you know, when I look at sort of um, some of these subgroups accessing higher levels. I'm curious how the um, you started the year working on a lot of anti-bias um, uh, teacher. Thank you, professional development. And I'm kind of curious how that. If hopefully we will see some of that because I, I mean that would be a real reason to do that professional development. I yes, think. I mean so you have. Uh, you have two factors there. You do have the possibility of implicit bias, right, or unconscious bias. Um, one of the things that we have as a district and I will always strongly advocate for is no teacher recommendation for higher level classes because that prevent, presents an opportunity for unconscious bias to creep in. The other thing that I think you're up against um, is this phenomenon of internalized racism. So part of it is also helping the students to see themselves as wanting to make the leap. It's hard right now for many of our students of color, many of them say, I'd like to take that class, but I don't want to be the only one in that class. You know. So part of it is building a cohort of students and, and changing a culture so that you don't have to be the only one. I have no idea what that feels like. You know, it's hard for me to say you should take it because you're ready when the student says, yeah, but I don't want to be the only one. Ms. Foss? I think I have a question and a comment. The question is just the same. Do we have any idea why this has gone down so much from 17 to 18? And I think I'm hearing you say we don't, but we should keep asking. And I think it's important to highlight that it did and try to figure out why. Um, and I wonder, I don't know if we have data for 2016, but I'd certainly like to keep around 17 and just really look over more than just two years. It's a little noise, maybe, it, maybe it's not the full story. Um, but then, um, I think we're all on the same page, but I might phrase it differently. Um, I, this idea of these advanced honors classes and just general ed classes, I think there's a real place for both of those for lots of kids, and putting kids in an advanced honors class when they're not ready for it can be equally um, disruptive to their education because if they don't really, they have to kind of fake their way along and not learn it very well. At the same time, this is where I think we're really all on the same page. We want to see, you know, roughly the percent of each of these subgroups in our school system in those honors classes because one subgroup isn't supposed to be represented more differently, right? But um, 
that's one area where I hear a lot where I, do, I don't know if we do this equitably or in a good way for kids' education. It might be something to talk about more as we go, um, what those classes mean and how you might get there. A book I'm reading right now, really interesting, talking about how we can get more kids of color into higher level classes and have them be successful actually recommends and cites some research. I haven't read the original stuff, but it says it takes teachers pulling these kids, pulling kids aside and saying, you should go into honors integrated math too. And I'm, I am going to recommend you and having the teachers be aware of figuring out those kids that are less likely to go in, maybe because they are the only one that looks like them in that class, but really encouraging them. And I think that's where teacher recommendations actually can be helpful. I don't know what our policy is. So, I think I heard you say we don't do that, but it right, might be so, something we might want to consider. So maybe just a, a point on language. Of what I talk about recruiting, which I would consider to be the same as that. When I say recommendation, there are um, some systems where in order to get into a class, you need the teacher's basically approval to take the class. I see. So, you know, I, I would not want us to be in the position of having teachers denying kids access. I think, you know, even, even if it's ill-advised, if a child wants to take a class, we should allow that to happen and let the chips fall where they may. Ms. Fallon. Um, just sitting here looking at this, um, one of the things that came to mind that worked at the university level in getting students to kind of spread their wings and take a risk was to offer a class pass-fail. And I don't know if that's ever an option we've considered, but for a student to know that they just need to pass that class to get credit might make them more willing to take a risk on taking an honors class. Um, and so I don't know how that could work, but it is something that thinks that to me makes it seem like you would get more students willing to, to take that chance. Mm -hmm. So I think that's it for the high school's special things. So these were sort of my takeaways, and I'll ask for your takeaways. Really, this past year, the elementary schools are the engines of performance improvement. You know, as um, Ms. Hennessy was saying, sort of when you mush it all together, it wasn't every grade that did as well. But I think in general, it was the elementary that showed the, the biggest. Um, I think we're just about as good as we can be in English language arts. Um, we're just about as good as we can be in science. I think math is really where we need to focus. I don't think we can get to the top of the group in the next year. I think it's a two to three year process. Um, I think that you know if we can go anywhere from the two to four um, point CPI growth or two to four standards um, score point growth, that's a good path for us to be on. I think that we're going to find most of those improvements coming from grades three through six which includes four, we're, we're working on fractions now, and subgroups across grades. I think absenteeism is a real limiting factor for us, especially middle school and high school. Um, and as we were just discussing, that coursework disparity, even though compared to our group, we're good. Um, I'd love that to be much more representative of our high school as a, as a whole. And I also think it means in addition to maybe pass fail options, thinking about other ways to take advanced courses because it's not just AP and honors that counts for that. Um, and college courses can count for that. Um, community college courses can count for that. So maybe we need to expand the uh, menu of options for um, higher level coursework to um, attract more students to what we can offer within our buildings. So that's sort of my takeaways. And I would just sort of end by asking, do you have any other takeaways you want me to try to be mindful of as I start to think about the budget process? Mr. Mr. Uh, I'm just thinking now, I mean, one of the things that you mentioned earlier, John, I think it was a, a small detail, but um, okay, one of the things that I take away from here is potentially the, the where we need to go in terms of alignment of curriculum K-12. I know um, this has been brought up before. And again, in just looking at MCAS, we do see differences across the grades. We do see potential gaps. We uncovered those things, but it's still, those are my minute sort of details. If, if we had more time, if teachers, I think, had more time and staff had more time to work together across grades and, and across grade levels, I think we could potentially realize some great benefit, not only on the MCAS, but the overall student, student learning across our 
our grades. So I think that's embedded within within some of the data here. Other takeaways from folks? I, I also say chronic absence. We, we spent a lot of time talking about that. I still think there's data to look at. You know, the and the prospects of you writing a grant or doing something to bring to us in the budget, and budget cycle is very exciting. Uh, clearly, we need to do something, even if we're doing, even if the is just like other uh, parts of the state. That's something I really feel this community can do better at. We can do better at, and we, we all recognize we need to. So I'd love to focus something uh, in our future discussions around that. Understanding what the issue is and what we're currently doing would be a, a helpful sort of uh, information for us to have as you make your, your pitch for us to solve that. But thank you for paying attention to it. Ms. Fox? Um, I'm just coming, just kind of a brainstorm takeaway. We're looking at the equity issues in the high school. And they're certainly not tied one to one, but it's the same groups that are were observed performing lower in the MCAS. And I know MCAS isn't the whole story, third to eighth. And so I guess I would put out there that really working with kids who are underperforming in the MCAS, um, at least as a first step of identifying, getting them more help, identifying what we can do to help them. Um, probably would lead to them being more comfortable and feeling like they might want to take some of these more advanced classes by the time they get to high school. So a combination of that and working with teachers to really, um, at the other end of performance, to say, okay, I have some kids that are performing high and they're less likely to take advanced classes in high school because of these data you showed us. Let's make sure we tell them that they should be taking those advanced classes starting you know, early. Mr. Zahowski. I agree with what Ms. Voss said. You know, it's easy to look at the high school and say that by the time our students graduate, they're, they're showing really a great achievement. Um, and I think it's really exciting to think that if we can really do some interventions and help some of these students in the earlier grades, as Ms. Voss said, that when they get to the high school, not only Will they feel confident and ready to take some of those higher level courses, but um, that um, we can continue to see even higher achievement at the high school in areas where we almost think that maybe the range is um, at the high end already. But I think that with the confidence that comes along with doing well in the younger grades and building upon that, we can, we can see even greater things at the high school upon graduation. Ms. Hennessy. The budgetary, like something to look at. I would look at, at the high school level, the court, advanced courses that are offered and make sure there's a balance of those advanced courses that don't require a lot of prerequisites. Because I think sometimes kids mature enough, they don't really mature until they're maybe senior year, and then they maybe they can't take you know, AP Calc or um, AP Spanish, but they can take AP Micro or AP Psych to make sure there's a little bit more of a balance so those kids have that opportunity to do that. Ms. Voss and then Ms. Fallon. It's just a follow up here. I mean, I know we've started offering computer science, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no prerequisite for it. Yeah, something and like that. That's fantastic, and it's really open to a lot of people because we're doing that. Um, I had something else related, but I've lost it. <laughs> Ms. Um, I do wonder sometimes if it has something to do with interest level, like gauging like students' interest level, like what you know, if we teach with like Irish literature or whatever, like what is it that would be of interest to you to take and to offer something specifically targeted to those subgroups? Ms. Ms. Voss. I it, sorry. So I think it's also um, something you hear every once in a while and I, you know, oh, we have all these AP classes and we're so focused on that and it's expensive and this and that. And, and I just want to say I don't view it that way. I think um, from my from what I hear, the AP classes are really good, but they're also really crowded, like 30 to 35 kids in a lot of these AP classes. And so we are serving a lot of our high school population, and I don't want to leave here thinking, okay, it's sort of the kids taking AP and honors versus other groups. It's really about bringing everybody up at the same time, and if we keep those AP and honors classes available to more and more people and keep them really... Um, 
something people want to take, that helps everyone. And I, you know, I don't want to think, okay, just because the state's saying we have to focus more on the lower 25 performing kids means that we do less for the other 75. We have to, 75 percent, we have to keep everyone in mind. Any other, uh, any other thoughts? I would just close by inviting any feedback we had on the process tonight. And this is the first time we were trying one of these meetings. Um, the protocol worked for you. I mean, I hope it didn't. I have other ones you can try. If you prefer it when I just stand up here and say what I think the data is, we can do that too. But let me know um, personally, and I'll keep that in mind for future um, special meetings. Okay. Well, speaking of meeting targets, we're almost close to our target of 9 o'clock, where it's 9-11, um, so we were pretty efficient with our time. There's no other new business uh, for this evening. Uh, just let people know that we do have uh, some uh, subcommittee and advisory meetings. We have the Rules and Policy Subcommittee meeting on December 12th at 3.30 p.m. in the superintendent's office. Uh, we've got the Student Advisory Committee. Uh, which will precede our next meeting on the 13th, um, followed by the regular school committee meeting on December 13th, 2018. Um, and now I would accept a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So the meeting of November 27th is adjourned. <laughs>